Eric Reno. I'm a professor of uh, Earth System Science at the University of California in Irvine and uh, a consultant at the Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. I've always been interested in physics. I've always been interested in uh, alpine landscapes and climbing, stuff like that. But uh, uh, I came to glaciology a little bit uh, also by chance. You know? Somehow I was the right place at the right time with the right techniques and uh, that worked out pretty well. I have a great job. I love it. Most of our job is actually done um, on the computer with satellite data. They, they have completely revolutionized the way we look at uh, polar regions. Uh, they make the whole place accessible uh, to scientific analysis. Whereas before you were limited to where you could go and how long you could stay and how long your food supply would last. So um, most of my field work uh, involves things that I cannot do with satellite data. Uh, measure the thickness of the ice with some special radar sounders. Or in the past seven years I've been very involved in uh, looking at ocean properties. So we have to be on a boat and measure what's happening several hundred meters below the surface. You can't do that with remote sensing. It's always dangerous in the polar regions. We always have this false sense of feelings that uh, if, if we land here, we're going to be OK, but there's nobody around. <laughs> um, in, we, we work in the ocean, uh, in the glacial fjords in Greenland, uh, close to the Calvin front. Uh, we've been in situations where if there had been a big calving event, we would have been in, in trouble. We, we pushed the limit. We always try to um, have a safety margin. You know, it's really important for the crew and everything else. Of course, we don't want to kill ourselves doing that. Uh, you have to look at the ice up close. You have to peer down the crevasse. You know, you have to be in contact with the ice. It's uh, that's that's the beauty of being in the field is that you you can collect measurements that are, would be very difficult to collect from uh, remote sensing platforms. But you know, I have more close calls when I cross the street in San Francisco than when I'm in the glacial fjord in Greenland. We have many. The prime time way is to uh, look at elevation changes. Uh, it's not the best way, but that's the um, technique that was most readily available from satellites. Because to do that, you have to know where your satellite is in reference to the ground and measure that very accurately. So it's, it's very easy. Um, now we have uh, uh, gravity measurements from GRACE, uh, which required technological advance. It was launched in 2002, so it's pretty recent. Uh, it's limited a little bit in resolution. Uh, we can only see book, big footprints, or big, uh, big changes. Um, and otherwise, uh, we, uh, we have the, what we call the component approach. We look at what's going in into making changes in the ice sheet. So there's the flow of the ice, there's snowfall, there's melt. So all the surface climate is actually reconstructed by uh, models, by numerical models, which are constrained by real data, of course. Right? They're not completely models. They just have the physics in there. Uh, and we do a lot of measurements of the flow of ice towards the periphery. That's what I've been doing for pretty much most of my career, uh, using satellite data. So this way you compare what's coming out at the periphery with what's coming in as snowfall and is dissipated as melt and figure out if it's in balance or not. So it's a, um, all these techniques have, have to mature a lot. Um, uh, the technique I just described on uh, mass budget, we started to use that in the mid-90s. Uh, but it took a good decade to, to get it up to speed and at the level of precision that we wanted. And it was not just me, it involved a lot of other people uh, to make this possible. So <clears throat> looking at all these different um, lines of measurement, what, yeah. what is the picture emerging about what's happening to the ice sheets? Oh, that's a long story there, but uh, we've learned a lot of things, right? We started paying at these things. We started that in the early 1990s uh, to see if there was other, anything happening. And I think we've been going through discoveries and discoveries each time uh, going, wow. Uh, so in Greenland, we see all the outlet glaciers changing a lot. Uh, the interior is not changing contrary to what models predicted with an increase in uh, snowfall. We haven't seen any of that. Um, the glacier changes around Greenland are, are over the whole island, uh, not just in the southeast or central west, even in the north. 
Um, we get a report results this week of uh, the collapse of uh, an ice shelf and uh, the formation of a new tidewater glacier in northeast Greenland, way up there at 79 north, um, which uh, no, most of us did not think we would see that happening uh, uh, maybe in our lifetime. And in the Antarctic, uh, Antarctic is a big place. Um, we've learned that it's very important to look at every part of a big place. Don't think that because you know one little place you know about Antarctica. Antarctica is a very big uh, area. Uh, so there's uh, <coughs> the Antarctic Peninsula and the Pine Island Bay sector, which are changing very rapidly. Uh, we have very good observations for that. Um, and I think we've developed a good understanding of why it's happening and how. So there's a lot of, lot of changes, very interesting stuff for scientists because these changes are happening fast. Uh, not over centuries, over decades. Right? Well, a tipping point. Um, I'm not sure what a tipping point is. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's not it's not necessarily clear to say at that point in time we passed the threshold. It's probably very difficult to put your finger on it. But you can probably look, which is what we did um, back in May, at the past 20, 40 years of observation of one sector, and say, look, we've gathered enough information in this area, understanding the changes and see what's laying behind, to say this sector is sort of doom, it's going to keep retreating no matter what the climate does. It might retreat faster if climate warming continues at this pace, it might retreat slower. We, we don't know that absolutely for sure. But the fuse is already blown. Um, the idea is still probably um, uh, a little bit of a shock for some, some people in our community, but uh, I've been looking at this area long enough to, to be quite sure about that. The time scale is the, big, is the big issue. I think the community in general is very conservative with time scales. Um, um, all the observations we've collected in the, in the past decades are actually pointing towards shorter time scales than what the models are able to replicate. It's true for sea ice, the sea ice decay, most of the models are not able to replicate that. Uh, it's true for the decay of, of uh, glaciers and ice sheets. Uh, they're going on a pace faster than what the models projected and faster than even the present day models are able to, uh, to replicate. So a lot of the changes we're witnessing, um, we actually don't have any reference in time to say we know how it happened in the past, we know at what pace these things can retreat. There's no example of that. Uh, all the records of uh, collapse of marine ice sheets have been bulldozed by re-advance of, uh, of the glaciers. So these records don't exist. We know how fast some of the land terminating ice sheets can collapse, and they can collapse pretty fast. So the marine ice sheets, they probably can do it a lot faster. We probably are seeing that today in several parts of Antarctica and Greenland. Um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit shattering to say, hey, this is it, right? Uh, even for the scientists looking at it. It's kind of a big step to say, I think this place is falling apart. Yeah, I think the concept that this Antarctica is stable is a bit of a lullaby. There's, uh, <coughs> there's actually large parts of East Antarctica that are submarine. They contain more ice than West Antarctica. Um, they are probably not as closely exposed to warm water around the periphery. Uh, but at face value, I've never quite understood why there was so much emphasis on West Antarctica. Um, so right now, most of the changes are in one part of West Antarctica and in the peninsula, but there's some places in East Antarctica in the marine base basin where we see some changes that uh, are a little bit of red flags uh, that some of these places may change in the future uh, in a bigger way. They are changing in the way that you would expect if somehow more warm water is able to reach the glaciers. But the record is, a little bit, is still a little bit short and the signal is still a bit small there. It's more like a little flag. I don't know. Uh, but we're not doing a good job at that. Uh, I think most of the scientists are not trained for that. 
so they're a bit taken by surprise. They don't know how to deal with that very well. I'm trying to learn. I, I talk to people actually from digital media I, to ask them, how do we reach the people? Uh, you know, the feedback I get right now is you guys uh, really suck at it. You're not doing it right. Uh, I can tell that you're not trained to do this. Uh, the message is not passing. You know, you talk about these things like, oh, you know, business as usual, this glacier is falling apart, West Antarctica is, is going to be in an irreversible state of retreat. And uh, the people who listen to that may not click. They feel like, well, I, it doesn't seem so shattered by this, so why should I worry about it? Right? We should be a little bit more vocal and direct about these things. Uh, uh, you have somehow to take your scientist hat off and take a different hat to communicate that. You cannot communicate to the public the same way you communicate to your, to your colleagues. Um, it has to be a different level of communication. Another problem is that there's a, there's a slight distrust of science. Um, there's a slight um, uh, misunderstanding about how scientists do their work. Uh, I was at a panel recently and, and, and uh, one person in the audience told me why don't the scientists release their data? They have all this information and they don't release it to us. And I'm like, well, actually that's what they do every day. That's their job, to release the data and publish and make this public. So there's a little bit of miscommunication there. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the medias have a big role, the educational medias have a big role to play in that. The scientists have to get into gear, into being able to uh, express what they know, express uncertainties, and put that into a layman language that uh, the public can, can relate to. It's not easy. Uh, maybe we should all take acting classes or something like that. So you can communicate with your audience and read your audience. It's not just about making your spiel and hope that it works, right? You have to somehow see if you connect with your audience or not. Um, and as a scientist, when you make a presentation to your peer, to your colleagues, it's not something you worry about, you know, it's different. It's kind of a red herring. I mean, uh, you can also say that uh, I think more importantly, the people that uh, 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 encourage distrust of science usually have an agenda. They are usually sponsored to create uh, kind of confusion in the mind of pop the public. Uh, uh, they come up with these arguments that uh, these scientific facts are not, are not accepted by the community when you know it's not true. Uh, they're sort of lying. Uh, the only reason they would do that, if, if they are rather intelligent people, which I think they are, is that they are on an agenda and they are sponsored uh, to say those things by, uh, uh, you know, other groups of interest who don't really want these kind of stories to come on the front line because it's annoying. Yes, I think so. Um, on multiple levels, I think we see, uh, we see some significant changes. I think uh, sometimes I'm dis deconstructed even by my own community. I think we are very conservative in, in all of this. Um, uh, maybe there's not a sense of uh, social responsibility in that. And, and that can be understood from scientists. Scientists like to stick with the facts they know, with the data they have. Uh, they don't necessarily like to project uh, uh, based on that, but uh, that sort of slows down the process that makes the communication a little bit more confusing. Uh, you may hear a different message from different scientists, so the public is like, well, what should I believe here, right? Which, which one is reasonable, which one is pushing it, and why is he pushing it, why is not? Uh, um, and, uh, but Probably the greatest concern is that, uh, you know, we look at all these uh, IPCC projection. Uh, I'm involved with IPCC uh, and they have different scenarios of uh, climate change. Uh, the, like uh, burn as much as we can and to burn more reasonably and, and don't burn at all. Uh, which keeps a false sense that we are sort of controlling our future, but right now we're not. We are burning as fast as we can. Uh, we don't even have scenarios where we could try to burn even faster, which would bring a little bit of balance in these scenarios. So, uh, <clears throat> in all, I think it, it uh, encourages, uh, encourages st status quo. Uh, uh, there's no strong incentive to change anything now. 
uh, when we talk about West Antarctic, West Antarctic collapse, uh, I even heard comments saying, well, if it's happening no matter what, then it's too late. There's nothing to do. Let's keep doing our business as usual. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the lack of reaction uh, to everything that we put forward uh, based on science. Um, and I think the concern down the line is that it's going to take a lot more dramatic changes before people say, hey, we have to, we have to stop this. Uh, you know, we can make all the projection we want for the next 30, 40 years. It's, it's probably already written in stone by the way the climate is right now and the continuing emissions. Uh, even if there's some major shift in uh, global politics about that, it's, it's going to take some time to have an impact. The IPCC process is very rigorous, right? It involves the, uh, the, the best scientists in the world. They dedicate their time to this. They don't get extra pay for, for working for the IPCC. A lot of people don't realize that. They don't get extra money to work for the IPCC. And, and for four or five years, they dedicate a lot of their time uh, to putting these reports. They have to bring all the uh, collection of peer-reviewed publications uh, that appeared and, and provide a synthesis of that. Um, so we have to be very well aware of all the scientific publications. We have to maintain some level of quality uh, in, uh, in uh, the peering of these different uh, articles. And they have to write a synthesis that is understandable by their colleagues as well as uh, politicians and the general public. So it's a, it's a very large effort. Um, one of the drawbacks of IPCC is they have to make projections as well, and for that they have to use physical models. And the physical models are not perfect. They have, they have issues with them, and in the case of ice sheets, they have lots of issues. We know that they're very conservative, but that's the best we have. Um, but perhaps some of these uncertainties uh, and the consequences of these uncertainties are not, uh, are not put forward well enough in some cases. Uh, in the case of sea level rise from ice sheets, uh, I think the, uh, the IPCC presentation is, is rather on the conservative side. Right? Let's not push things forward because our models just can't, even though a lot of us feel like they should do a lot more. The IPCC has been accused of being alarmist. Alarmist? Exaggerating the impacts of climate change. No, I think IPCC has always been conservative. Uh, I think it's the rock solid basis of what we know about climate change. Uh, you would have a hard time dispute anything that's uh, mentioned in IPCC because it went through very rigorous review. It's a consensus, so a lot of the statements that are made in IPCC uh, represent a consensus between a number of scientists. Right? So it's, it's a moderator, it's a natural moderator of opinions. You're not going to express extreme opinions in IPCC because the community is not going to adhere to that. They're going to say it's too extreme, we don't know. You have to like median filter all of that. The first thing about climate warming is that the physical basis, we've known it for centuries. This is nothing new in the science of climate change today. You bring more CO2, more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it warms it up. It's undisputable. It's very solid physics, right? And <clears throat> uh, the science is looking at the impact of that on the climate, the impact on humans, the impact on sea level, the impact on precipitation. It's going to be the impact on food production. It's going to be the impact on where people live, right? They are pretty serious impacts. It's going to be impact on biodiversity, which in my opinion is even bigger than sea level rise, right? The, the decay of species. Uh, in the end, what we're saying, what most of the science is saying, is this changing are occurring very fast. We're on a very fast train heading for the wall, and that's not good. So we have to change, we have to change the way we live. And I often say uh, it's, it's, uh, it's common sense. Right? Uh, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we, we ran out of stone. We have, we have to leave the, old age, the oil age because oil, burning oil is not good for the climate, it's not good for us. Uh, but it's a huge shift in our society. It's, uh, it's a huge shift in the way we live. Um, it's not going to take a few scientists uh, raising the red flag to make this happen. It has to be a big social movement where everybody says, hey, uh, we want to stop this. And my only hope right now that this is going to happen is the new generation.
the young people from 20 to 30 uh, because I think they're more sensitive to this. Uh, they don't want this kind of, uh, of, of world down the line and they probably are the first generation who can actually change it. They have the power to change it. I hope they take it. I hope they take it.